25 minutes to nine. All this week, we've been hearing stories brought to us by Today Programme listeners. That's you. This morning, our listeners are Dr Lisa Wright and Dr Mark Walton, both clinical psychologists who work on Merseyside in the only NHS unit of its kind, where they're trying to cut criminal offending rates using therapy. It's not an alternative to prison. The NHS Forensic Psychology Centre in Liverpool works with people who have served custodial sentences who might be at risk of re-offending. But uniquely, the unit also works with families in the community to stop new parents who might be at risk of serious offending from committing crimes. Our home and legal affairs correspondent Dominic Cassiani visited the NHS Forensic Psychology Centre and this is the first time that they've allowed journalists in to see the work they do. I'm outside Liverpool Crown Court. Few courts in the country dish out more justice than this rather intimidating piece of brutalist architecture, just a seagull swoop from the Mersey. Today there are 17 courts running at full pelt. We've got three defendants up for possession of weapons, a few for assaults, threats to kill, two alleged robbers, two suspected arsonists and six people facing a variety of sexual offences. This is the tide of violence and human misery that's not unique to Merseyside. This court and courts around the northwest really a complete wide range of offences to be honest. Isabella Denwhite is three years into her career here as a barrister. You come into court and see a really horrible offence but then when you speak to a defendant and you often learn of the really tragic upbringing they've had often things could be tackled to do with their life that may help stop them either committing those offences or committing any offence in the future. Listening to the grim tales of criminals in courts is my bread and butter but I'm not here for that. I'm in Liverpool to meet two today listeners who want to show us their work in crime prevention. Hi it's Dominic from the BBC. Lisa, isn't it? Yes. Dominic, hi. Hi, Hi. Dominic. Nice to meet you. I'm Mark. I'm Dr Lisa Wright. I'm a consultant clinical psychologist and the service lead for Mersey Forensic Psychology Service, which is part of Mersey Care NHS Foundation Trust. I'm Dr Mark Walton. I'm also a consultant clinical psychologist and I'm the clinical lead for the mental health treatment requirements across Merseyside and Cheshire. So this is one of our consulting rooms or therapy rooms. This is where people have psychological therapy, usually one-to-one and usually weekly sessions. For 30 years, this clinic has worked with ex-offenders in the community. Their clients include people convicted of violence and serious sexual crimes. For the last six years, they've expanded to include people who haven't yet offended. It's the only NHS prevention service of its kind. The overall aim for all our clients is to prevent them either first time offending or re-offending. Working with habitually violent or sexual offenders is difficult. Dr Wright says her team looks at traumas suffered in childhood that have damaged an adult's thinking. If you imagine a child growing up in a home or in a care home where they don't feel safe, Imagine them being beaten up regularly by a parent. A common theme that we hear is that as the child gets older and they grow bigger, there comes a day where they fight back. So in that moment, they've learnt that the way I can feel safe is by attacking other people. And in their mind, it becomes a thing of two options where they feel I'm either vulnerable, weak, hurt, or I'm strong, dominant, safe. They take that forward into adult life and into adult interactions. So therapy then is about helping to realise that there's a middle ground, that instead of one extreme or the other, that they can learn how to feel safe without hurting other people. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your understanding smile. And thank you for taking the time and to listen for a while. I thought you'd think I'm selfish. In the clinic's office, there are cards from the men and women who they've helped and this poem from a client whose offending was linked to drugs. I now feel like a toddler who's first learning their ABCs. You have given me the tools to lift myself up from my knees. You have given The hardest part of their work is reaching potential sex offenders. So we have posters, we have leaflets in GP surgeries. How many people are coming to you via that? The numbers are lower than we expected. We've only had about 20 people since we launched in 2018. You know, clearly some people are scared of coming forward, but what would you say to them to make them think differently? We've worked with people who have changed and who have lived healthy, meaningful lives and have made really bold changes in their life and offer that as a message of hope and that we're willing to try we're willing to try and work with them all right i'm now recording so harry and just for the tape we're not going to use your voice how did you first 
come into this clinic? I wanted to come here when I first heard about the therapy to reduce my risk of reoffending and to live a normal life. I knew I was ready to commit to do to it and complete the course, but I was quite scared to say things I had never really said before about my childhood. Harry, not his real name, voluntarily came in after serving a sentence for sexual abuse. He too had been abused. Since completing therapy eight years ago, he's not offended. Now I've got a job, I'm not waking up overnight, I can sleep properly, I've got no intrusive thoughts about children. I understand that it's a really, really bad offence and it should never have happened. I suppose just locking somebody up isn't going to change what's made them offend. So if they're going to be re-released at some point, then we need to know that they are going to be safer when they're released. A lot of people take the view that prison works. You lock people up, they can't commit a crime. But that, that approach is waiting until people have committed a crime and created a victim and caused damage and pain and distress that might affect someone's whole life and then locking them up. Why can't we use what we know works with people earlier on so they don't go to create that victim? The impact of Mercy Care's programme is difficult to quantify, but Lisa Jones of Liverpool John Moores University has figures for the costs of doing nothing. We estimated that the costs of violence in Merseyside are around £200 million, so quite a substantial amount of money. £200 million a year? £200 million, yes, within one year. Who's bearing the biggest burden there? How do these costs break down? For the police and criminal justice system, we saw £143 million. Uh, For the healthcare system, it was £33.5 million. And in terms of lost productivity, that effect of people either missing work or having to take time off work, it was £32.9 million. I just want to make sure you know how much you have helped me. You have had the support has been good to bring on my confidence. It's helped me to become a good dad and better partner. Absolutely amazing. More thank yous. Cards sent to Dr. Lisa Marsland of Liverpool's Babs Therapy Programme. She works with new parents at risk of offending. There's a mum with with white hair and she's one of our volunteers now. And she had every risk, adversity under the sun that, you know, probably could have ended up with Lisa's forensic service in a sense. She she had a tag when she was pregnant, poor mental health, domestic violence, and with the right support at the right time, you know, to help her have that bond and attachment and separate out those issues from a son who she loves and adores. She's testament really to how many of our vulnerable families can break through difficult times and can break cycles. In Babs, our ethos is there's no such thing as hard to reach families. They're not just going to turn up at a clinic. They're not just going to respond to a text message when they've got no credit on the phone. If you invest more in prevention, early intervention, services like Babs, you won't need to build more prisons. You won't need to build another kind of Ashworth hospital because you're supporting very vulnerable families at the earliest opportunity to break those cycles. Dr Lisa Wright and Dr Mark Walton argue now is the time for government to grasp this nettle. What the public want generally from sentencing is for people to be less likely to go on and offend again. And I guess our ethos is very much in line with that. What kind of results have you had with your service users? They will constantly tell you that they've developed some element of personal growth. So people can change, but they can also change before they've actually committed an offence. If we looked at how much it costs, and if someone commits a crime, how much it costs to investigate them, to arrest them, to them, to go through a trial, to get put in prison, how much it costs for the victim to get help for mental and physical problems, I think you might find that it's cheaper to invest in prevention. Well, that was Dominic Casciani uh, reporting. And thank you so much to our listeners, Dr. Lisa Wright and Dr. Mark Walton, for their contribution. Uh, Let's, one of the things we try and do on this programme is bring our listeners together with people who are actual uh, experts uh, in the field as well. And Andy Cook is HM Chief Inspector of Constabulary and uh, and Fire and Rescue, also former Chief Constable of Merseyside Police, and has joined us in the studio. Andy, good to see you. Good morning. What's your instinctive reaction to what you just heard? I I could see you were listening very, very intently. I think your contributors there have explained it perfectly about the importance of prevention um, and identifying those those underlying causes that lead to offending behaviour. I mean, prevention and rehabilitation are equally massively important. Um, not just, and we heard the economic costs of it there, just on Merseyside, £200 million was the cost. Um, across the country, obviously, it's it's much, much bigger than that. Uh, But prevention has always been a difficulty for policing because, firstly, during the austerity period when resources were cut, uh, it didn't just affect policing but social services, youth, national health and others. So some of the good work that was going on to address 
uh, underlying issues and that prevention right across the system um, became harder and harder to do. Um, but we've got to get back to a position where prevention, which is the most important thing for policing, um, but it's not just a policing issue. I was going to say, it, it, it's an age-old debate, which I know you're close to and you've thought about for decades, actually, which is most people who commit these crimes are poor. And what we heard about there really was eight minutes, Dominic Casciani reporting, it was a chronicle of poverty. Mm. There's an age-old, age-old question. What should you address? Do you address poverty or do you address the consequences of poverty? It's a very good question. When I left um, my role as Chief Constable of Merseyside, I gave a media interview where I said that the most important way of preventing crime is to reduce poverty and increase opportunity. Uh, And that hasn't changed. I mean, it's pointless just putting money into policing to prevent crime. It's got to go right across the system. And there's got to be that join-up across government to actually address the issues because National Health Service, Youth Services, Social Services, local authorities and police need to work together at an early age to address some of these issues. It's difficult to measure the benefits of prevention sometimes, but everyone instinctively knows it's absolutely the right thing to do. And I am encouraged that this government is looking to introduce uh, Young Futures Hubs uh, to really start addressing before people commit offences uh, the underlying issues that cause so much crime. But one of the other things the government's had to do, they would say, their position is that they've had to release some prisoners early because of the situation mm. in our prisons. And there are lots of people, in fact, including Sir John Major, who I was speaking to about this subject, lots of people who say there are too many non-violent people going to prison. Do you think that the phrase, the ethos around the idea that prison works, which is going back some decades now, do you think it's distorted how we think about prevention in this country? Uh, It has. I mean, prison only works for the period of time that those individuals are in prison. And it doesn't work if they come out and they're more likely to commit crimes afterwards. Absolutely. So prison without rehabilitation and a lot of work going on around rehabilitation while prisoners are in the prisons uh, is not a long term strategy for success at all. So and, you know, we've heard from the chief inspector of prisons about prisoners being locked up for 23 hours, no rehabilitation work going on. It's an issue right across the criminal justice system. That join-up needs to be there between all the different agencies to ensure that we actually start making progress in this. We continue to reduce crime by actually intervening with people, usually at a younger age, to prevent them going down that path of criminality. All right, Andy, very good to speak to you. I see you've uh, put a lot of thought and time into this over the years and hope we can talk to you about it again. Andy Cook, thank you very much. Thank you.